Welcome to Learning with Philemon. In this video, we will be looking at how mass spectrometry works and how we can use it to determine the relative molecular mass and the structure of an unknown compound. Let's first take a look at how a mass spectrometer works. We can split the operation of a mass spectrometer into five steps. The first step is to vaporize the sample. This means that the sample is turned into a gaseous state as shown in the equation. M stands for molecule in this case. The gaseous sample can then enter the mass spectrometer. The second step is to ionize the sample. A high energy electron beam is directed onto the sample. When these electrons collide with a molecule, they knock out an electron from its valence shell due to the electrostatic repulsion. Remember that like charges repel. As can be seen in the equation, the molecule is now a positive ion. Note that more than one electron may be removed, so the ion could have a positive charge larger than one plus. The third step is to accelerate the ions. To do this, an electric field is used. The positive ions are attracted to the negatively charged plate. The electrostatic force of attraction causes the positive ions to accelerate. The fourth step is deflection. To do this, a magnetic field is used. When a charged particle or molecule moves in a magnetic field, it experiences a force. This causes it to change direction. As can be seen in the diagram, a curved path is followed. How much the charged molecule is deflected depends on its mass and charge. This is commonly referred to as the mass to charge ratio, m divided by z. The larger the mass of the molecule, the less it is deflected, as a larger force is required for it to accelerate. The red dotted line is an example of less deflection, where the path is straighter. The larger the charge of the ion, the greater the force experienced, so the larger the deflection. The blue dotted line represents more deflection, where the path is more curved. The strength of the magnetic field can be varied so that specific mass to charge ratios reach the detector. In this case, the green dotted line makes it all the way to the detector. The fifth step is detection. When the charged molecule strikes the detector, an electrical current is produced, which is proportional to the abundance of the ion. The more ions with that mass to charge ratio, the larger the current produced. Gathering data for different m to z ratios allows us to plot a graph. In the next slide, we will see how we interpret this type of graph. Here is an example of a graph produced from mass spectroscopy. The x-axis is the mass to charge ratio of the ions detected. The y-axis is the relative intensity or relative abundance. The ion that is detected the most is set at 100%, and the rest of the ions are given a value relative to this. This is the mass spectrum of 4-heptanone. 4-heptanone has a molecular formula of C7H14O and the following skeletal formula. Remember that step 2 in mass spectrometry is ionization. If you want to test your knowledge, pause the video now and name the other four steps. When 4-heptanone is ionized, we form this ion. Note that as an electron is lost, the mass is not significantly altered. The ion goes through the mass spectrometer and is detected. To calculate the relative molecular mass, we should add all the relative atomic masses of the elements in the molecular formula as we find them in the periodic table. The mass of the ion is 114, and the charge is 1 plus. This gives us a mass to charge ratio of 114. This is why we see a peak here. Note that if two electrons were lost, the charge would be 2 plus. This would give us a mass to charge ratio of 228. We do not see this peak in the mass spectrum. The peak with the highest mass to charge ratio often corresponds to the molecular ion. The molecular ion is the molecule in the original sample, but with a charge. 
But if the sample only contained 4 heptanone, why are there other peaks in the graph? Pause the video and think about this. Because of the positive charge, the molecular ion is not stable and breaks down into smaller fragments. If those fragments have a positive charge, then they are detected by the mass spectrometer. For example, the most abundant peak for 4 heptanone is at 43. This corresponds to this alkyl chain, breaking off the molecular ion. The peak we see at 43 is due to the ion C3H7+. Here we see the skeletal formula of this ion. These fragment ion peaks are actually very useful in determining the structure of a compound. 3-heptanone and 4-heptanone are positional isomers. They have the same molecular formula. You would not be able to distinguish them from the molar mass or the functional groups present. However, their two mass spectra have noticeable differences. Both isomers have a molecular ion peak at 114 as expected, as they both have the same relative molecular mass. However, the fragment ion peaks are very different. 3-heptanone has a peak with 100% intensity at a mass-to-charge ratio of 57. This could be due to this fragment, C4H9+. We do not see a large peak at 57 for 4-heptanone, because it is not likely for this ion to form. It would be unlikely to break off a 4-carbon chain from 4-heptanone without including the oxygen atom. This is why we see a peak at 71 instead. This corresponds to this fragment, which includes 4 carbon atoms and the oxygen atom, C4H7O+. Although you might not be able to identify every fragment ion peak in a mass spectrum, it can help you identify sections of an unknown molecule. As you can see in this example, it can also help you distinguish between two very similar molecules. In the next video, we will explore the role of isotopes in mass spectrometry. To consolidate your learning, please try the questions in the description. Thank you for listening. If you haven't already, please subscribe for more content. Stay curious.